They found his skeleton beside a makeshift shelter on the beach, near the pounding surf of the mid-Atlantic. He tried to survive alone on a desolate island called Ascension. Beside the body was a journal, which told one of the most remarkable stories in seafaring history. Here was a second Robinson Crusoe, who waited for rescue, but instead perished in his own private hell. It has stood the test of time. God's book, the Bible, still relevant in today's complex world. It is written, sharing hope around the globe. By order of the Commodore and captains of the Dutch fleet, I was set on shore on the 5th of May, 1725, upon the island of Ascension, which struck me with great dread and uneasiness, having no hopes of remaining, but that the Almighty God would be my protector. So begins the journal of an anonymous seaman's four-month ordeal. Some terrible crime, had caused the authorities to abandon him on this desolate island with only a cask of water, a hatchet, a tea kettle, a tarp and a few other items. The man quickly set up a tent and began foraging for food. He felt terribly abandoned, of course, but kept climbing the hills each day in the hope of spotting some stray ship. Within a few days, he managed to locate a tiny stream amid the high rocks. He was also able to catch birds and turtles to eat, along with the rice he'd been given. But as May turned to June, and June to July, water became more scarce on the island. The seaman spotted some mountain goats on one of his wanderings, and he followed them to a few pools of water in the rocks. But these two steadily dwindled. Soon, there was no water to be found anywhere. The man was reduced to drinking the blood of turtles he'd killed with his hatchet, and then to drinking seawater, even though he knew that this was deadly. His last journal entry reads, I'm becoming a moving skeleton. My strength is entirely decayed. I can't write much longer. This anonymous seaman endured great physical suffering during his gruelling struggle to survive. But there was a much greater pain, a pain that echoed and re-echoed in his head. It was something that was repeated throughout his journal, and that was his consuming guilt. He wrote mournfully, Night is an emblem of my crimes, and each clear day renews my punishment. And later he exclaimed in the journal, what incredible pain this wretched mortal feels. My foolish actions have reduced me to this misery and now I'm doomed to suffer for all eternity. My guilt consumes me. In his isolation and deprivation, the seaman's guilt began to take on a voice and a form. He was tormented by blasphemous curses and, and vile expressions which erupted in the dead of night, out of nowhere. He began to see frightening apparitions. The vast faceless sea imprisoning him permitted no rescue. His hours spent gazing out at the horizon in vain sank him even more deeply into despair. He was all alone in the universe. No one would ever come for him. In the end, the man succumbed. And what's most haunting is this tortured man's words regarding his past, his unforgiven past. He wrote, My crime was of the most evil kind. I cannot imagine any way that I could atone for my crime. No punishment could ever make up for so great an offence. There's nothing in this world quite so isolating as guilt. The punishment this nameless prisoner received would be considered cruel and unusual today. It probably was back then as well. But it gives us a graphic picture of one of our deepest problems, guilt, inescapable guilt. In recent years, pop psychology has tried its best to rid us of this chronic problem. We've been assured that 
we're no worse than the next guy. That our guilt feelings are just, well, feelings. And we can choose to feel whatever we want. We've been told that we should just accept the way we are unconditionally and without any remorse. Best-selling books have promoted sex without guilt and self-fulfillment without guilt and assertiveness without guilt and looking out for number one without guilt. Well-meaning people have done their best to sweep guilt right off the horizon. The message we're getting is that guilt is simply a mistake. Well, if it is a mistake, it's one that we keep right on making. Guilt doesn't go away, however, when we try to massage the psyche. Why? One of the principal reasons is this. We keep trying to deal with the symptoms instead of the root of the problem. We want to anaesthetize those unpleasant feelings instead of facing their source. And so, of course, those feelings just keep coming up again. They just keep coming back. I'd like to remind you that there was one physician of the soul who dealt with the problem thoroughly at the root. There was only one man in history who offered a realistic rescue from guilt. Let's look first at his diagnosis. We find it here in the Gospel of John. Jesus is pointing out man's basic problem to a Pharisee named Nicodemus. He says in John chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Through these words, Jesus is explaining why some men are condemned even though he came into the world to save us and not to condemn us. It's because people turn away from the light, God's truth. They're afraid of something dark inside being revealed or exposed. Notice how the issue is not how much good or bad we have inside us. It's taken for granted that we all make mistakes. We all do things that make us feel guilty. The issue is really how we respond when we get the opportunity to recognize our mistakes. When God wants to shine his light inside of us, do we honestly confess what's there or do we continue to deny the true depth of our failings? Guilt can never be fixed until we acknowledge that we have sinned. So we deserve to feel guilty. Every single one of us breaks the law of God, the law of the universe. Guilt isn't something to try to sweep under the carpet. It's not a sign pointing us away from God, but it points us to the cure, the solution. People have a chronic problem with guilt only if they keep ignoring the sign. The Bible tells us that we're all on an island surrounded by a hostile sea. Sin has separated us from God. We need rescue. We're exactly the same as that nameless, wretched castaway on the island of Ascension. He realized to his anguish that the wages of sin is death. And like him, we can't survive on our barren island. We need a reconciliation with God. And yet our sin is precisely what isolates us from him. The book that we're offering as a free gift to all our It Is Written viewers today can help you get started in that process of reconciliation. It's called Steps to Christ, and it's one of my personal favorites. The theme of this series of programs is simply salvation. In the pages of Steps to Christ, you and your family will discover how God saves us and how we can be sure of our standing with Him. Read this wonderful book and you'll discover ways to becoming whole in this broken world in which we live. I know this book will give you much encouragement and a solid ground for hope. Remember, Steps to Christ is absolutely free and there's absolutely no obligation. So please call or visit our website and order your copy now. Here's the information you need. Phone 1300 300 389 or visit our website itiswritten.com.au to request today's free offer 
and we'll send you this easy to read and inspirational book totally free of charge and with no obligation. So don't delay. Call 1300 300 389 or visit our website to request today's free offer. If you'd like to support this ministry, please send your donations to PO Box 1115 Warunga, New South Wales 2076 Australia. Call us now on 1300 300 389 or visit our website to request today's free offer. Call us now. Now, let's get back to this problem of guilt. What's the solution to the dilemma? The answer is beautifully illustrated by one of history's most epic voyages. It happened during one of Sir Ernest Shackleton's early trips of exploration across the Antarctic Ocean in 1914. During this expedition, his ship, the Endurance, was crushed in an ice floe. The crew drifted for days until they could make a landing on Elephant Island. Shackleton had the men set up a camp where they could preserve their supplies and try to survive the coming winter. But he soon realized that no one would be coming to rescue them. No one had any idea where they were. They were cut off from the world by the freezing, stormy Antarctic Ocean. There was only one hope of rescue. Someone had to cross that hostile ocean and get help. Shackleton began to rig a seven metre whaling boat for the voyage. From volunteers, he picked a crew of six. They would have to cross over 1,300 kilometres of tempestuous seas in order to reach a Norwegian whaling station on a frozen island called South Georgia. It seemed an impossible task in an open boat at the stormiest time of the year. But Shackleton set out with his men. For days they huddled under a, a makeshift canvas covering, leaning, crouching together, huddled, keeping the bow turned into the fierce waves, praying that the winds wouldn't tear their small sail away. They endured bone-chilling cold, sleeping bags frozen stiff, icy water streaming down their backs, hunger and thirst, it was utter torture. But 14 days after their voyage began, when all were almost dead of exposure and thirst, they spotted there on the black cliffs of South Georgia, that little whaling station. Shackleton had made it through and soon a ship would be on its way to rescue the rest of his stranded men. And in a similar way, when God looked down at our predicament and saw that we were isolated on an island, surrounded by a boundless sea of sin, he did one thing. He plunged into that hostile sea himself. He took on the murderous, icy vastness of the evil of mankind to save his doomed people. Now, come with me to a rocky garden called Gethsemane. Jesus is praying there in agony, fully aware of the ordeal ahead of him. Will Christ submit willingly to the horror of the cross? Will he risk the unthinkable, eternal separation from the Father? Christ, alone and prostrate in Gethsemane, was a little like Shackleton, staring out into that forbidding Antarctic Ocean. To take his tiny boat into that hostile danger meant almost certain death. Yet, that's the only way he could hope to save his men. Jesus also realized that there was only one way to save mankind from the penalty of sin. He had to absorb the sentence of death in his own body. He had to take on the agonies of hell. And so with trembling lips, the Savior said, Not my will, Father, but your will be done. Listen as the footsteps of the mob approach. Their bobbing torches flash in the dark. Judas approaches Jesus and says, Hail Master, and betrays him with a kiss. Suddenly, the divine Son of God is pushed into the crowd. They spit in his face. They yank at his beard. A fist strikes him in the eye. A slap stings his face. This is the very one whose name angels carry to galaxies afar, singing, Holy, Holy, Holy. This is the one who hung worlds in space. But now a sweaty, cursing, cruel mob takes him in their calloused hands. 
Now, come with me to Pilate's judgment hall. False witnesses come forth to accuse the Son of God. He's despised and mocked. The spotless, innocent Lamb of God is sentenced as a guilty offender. He's condemned for sins he's never committed so that I can have my well-deserved guilt removed. He's tried and convicted so that I can be tried and acquitted. Now, come with me to Pilate's courtyard. A muscular Roman soldier raises his thick arm. Listen to the snap of the whip. Watch as Jesus' back is torn and blood flows from the gaping wounds. Many men who went through this scourging were all but disemboweled. Jesus, the one who existed with the Father from all eternity, the one worshipped by countless angels, he was wounded for our transgressions, just as the prophet Isaiah predicted. He was bruised for our iniquities. He took the blows that we should have taken. The chastisement of our peace is upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Now, come with me to a hill called Calvary. A crown of thorns is jammed upon his head. Spikes are driven through his hands and his feet into a cross. The instrument of execution is lifted up and, and falls with a thud into its hole. Tissues and tendons and muscles tear. His limbs are pulled out of joint. He feels like he's suffocating. But strange as it may seem, this physical torture was drowned out by something else. Another kind of pain consumed this isolated man. We hear it in his dark cry, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus experienced in those moments the most horrendous experience possible, eternal separation from God. As he suffered, he evidently couldn't see through the darkness of the tomb. He didn't see himself rising victorious in the resurrection. But still, he was willing to go into the grave, even if he never came out. He did that so you and I could be with his father forever. Jesus was willing to give up his place in heaven so that you and I could sit on his throne. I can't imagine a love like that. I can't grasp the immensity of Christ's sacrifice. I can only gaze in wonder at these scenes that make vivid the words of John. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. But once in a while, here on our sin-darkened planet, we get a tiny glimpse of what such a sacrifice really means. On February 3rd, 1943, the SS Dorchester was torpedoed in the North Atlantic. This transport ship filled with American soldiers took on water rapidly and began listing to starboard. Everything on board was sheer chaos. The radio had been knocked out. Men rushed around on the deck on the ragged edge of panic. Many had run up from the hold below without life jackets. Overcrowded lifeboats capsized. Rafts drifted away before anyone could reach them. Survivors would later testify that there seemed only one little island of order in all the confusion. That was where the four chaplains stood on the steeply sloping starboard side. A pastor, a rabbi, a minister and a priest. These chaplains were calmly guiding men to their boat stations. They distributed life jackets from a storage locker and then helped these men, frozen with fear, over the side. One survivor recalls hearing the noise of hundreds of men crying, pleading, praying, swearing. But through it all, the chaplain spoke words of courage and confidence. They said, come men, step into the lifeboat, men. This witness then testified, their voices were the only thing that kept us going. When the supply of life jackets was gone, the four chaplains handed out their own. One of the last men to get off the deck when the ship was going down looked back and saw the chaplain standing firm, still, their arms linked, braced against the slanting deck. Across the waves, their voices still sounded, praying in Latin, praying in Hebrew, 
praying in English. As one seaman put it, it was the finest thing I've ever seen or hoped to see this side of heaven. And in the same way, this side of heaven, we also have to pause in awe and look back at the one Jesus who went down with the ship for us. Those chaplains were willing to plunge into the icy, dark waters of the North Atlantic so that a few more young men could live. Jesus was willing to disappear, if necessary, forever into the darkness of the grave, consumed by sin, in order to offer every human being eternal life. Jesus is standing on the deck of our sinking ship, handing out life jackets today. He knows he's going down with the ship, but he wants to make sure that each of us has a life jacket. As the Bible's best known text says in John chapter 3 and verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The promise is for whoever. Rich, poor, young, old, everyone. Whether you're good or bad or somewhere in between, you need a life jacket. And Jesus is passing them out to whoever. You don't have to perish in an icy sea, isolated from the Father. Thank God we don't have to bear our guilt alone, like that tortured seaman on the island of Ascension. No, we can't atone for our sins. We can't make up for our mistakes. But yes, the penalty has been paid. The vastness of the sea of sin has been crossed. Our rescue is at hand. From the cross, Jesus is able to tell us, you don't have to perish. You can have the gift of everlasting life. Come to me and confess your sins. Accept my rescue. I've come such a long way and gone through so much to give it to you. So let's thankfully accept this gift of amazing grace, the wonderful gift that the Savior offers us. Let's accept it right now as we pray. Father in heaven, we're tired of trying to survive on our little island. We can't deal with our guilt alone. There's no remedy for the sickness in our souls. And so we come to the cross where you have created a cure at such great cost. Thank you for bridging the murderous sea of sin. Thank you for the gift of grace. Thank you for laying your body down so that we may cross safely into the arms of our Father. We confess our sins, our indifference, our ill will. Thank you for reaching out to us in grace. Thank you for the pardon and reconciliation and acceptance that you've given. We place our faith in you as our Saviour and Lord. We dedicate our lives to you. Thank you for taking us just now, just as we are. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I hope that today is the start of a wonderful new relationship between you and Jesus. He's the ultimate source of forgiveness. And to help you get a bigger picture of how God wants to care for you and nurture you, I want to remind you about our free gift book for all It Is Written viewers today. It's called Steps to Christ. What do we do to claim Christ's salvation? Well, this very special book takes the good news of Calvary's cross and brings it right down to practical life today. Now is the time to take your stand, your new beginning. It's time to discover how faithfulness to God can make a difference. And your free copy of Steps to Christ is a first step in that direction. Steps to Christ is a wonderful book and I want you to have a copy as soon as possible. I really do. Remember, there's no cost or obligation. Call 
or visit our website at any time and ask for Steps to Christ by name. Here's the information you need. Phone 1300 300 389 or visit our website itiswritten.com.au to request today's free offer and we'll send you this easy to read and inspirational book totally free of charge and with no obligation. So don't delay. Call 1300 300 389 or visit our website to request today's free offer. If you'd like to support this ministry, please send your donations to PO Box 1115 Warunga, New South Wales 2076 Australia. Call us now on 1300 300 389 or visit our website to request today's free offer. Call us now. If you've been inspired by this week's program, be sure to join me again next week when It Is Written will bring you another totally new and thought-provoking perspective on the peace, insight, understanding and hope that only the Bible can give us. It Is Written truly is television that changes lives. Until next week, remember, It Is Written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. for India is giving sight to the blind and you could be part of this amazing humanitarian project. There are 52 million blind people in the world and 15 million of those live in India. There are more blind people in India than any other country in the world. Many could see again if only they could have cataract surgery. It is written Oceania is making this happen. Our project, Eyes for India, has a mobile clinic equipped with professional staff that brings this life-changing service to thousands of people each year who otherwise may not have the opportunity to have their sight restored. You may be their only hope. For just $75, you will be giving the gift of sight to people who desperately want to see. All you need to do is call 1-300-567-297. That is 1-300-567-297. Or visit our website www.itiswrittenoceania.tv to donate and support Eyes for India. You can also write to It Is Written Oceania, PO Box 1115, Warunga, New South Wales 2076, Australia.